Welcome to the J3 University Podcast. I'm your host, John Jewett. And I'm your co-host, Luke Miller. Our mission is to elevate the physique coaching standard. And deliver the highest level of competitors to the stage. Let's jump into today's episode. More protein, more mass. How much protein do we actually need to really optimize the muscle building process? We hear lots of different ranges to, at least anecdotally, super high protein is what's needed. And the more you take, the more you can grow. Then we see also like evidence-based practitioners recommending what seems like lower intakes. Is it actually lower or not? And where do we really fit within the anecdotal, within the actual literature evidence? And are they crossing paths to really come up with some solid recommendations for what we should do as bodybuilders? Yep. So that's where we're at. Yeah, I think um, I think this is a, an interesting topic because there's some context to be had of like contest prep versus off season. Does it fluctuate? Are you making adjustments relative to residuals? And I think we can kind of start this conversation with some of the anecdote. And obviously, John, you said you had talked to a few people around just getting some differing opinions kind of across the industry and just looking at like what's working and, and kind of comparing that to some of the recommendations that, that we give out. And I know that that's kind of like a great start point of, you know, what are, what are the best in the world doing and what does that start to kind of compare to how we see the research world view this? Yeah, I think, you know, the research world, some people get it mixed. It's like a lot of times we're doing all this stuff in practice and that spurs on the idea to go, conduct a study, investigate why something is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's helps hone our ideas and maybe changes how we apply things. Maybe it doesn't. So it's really helping us to understand what we're seeing work out in the trenches. But some people are trying to take just research and apply it to making a coaching approach, which with basically negating all what's been done previously in the trench and in the coaching world, which I feel like that's the wrong application around research. So Absolutely. I think a starting starting point is for us to see what are the top, we're going to talk about pros, pro IBB pros doing. Um, and of course, we're get diving into enhanced versus natural. We'll cover that topic as well. But I wanted to see guys that are actually improving at the highest level possible and big humans, What is what are their actual protein intakes look like? And how does that align with research recommendations? Then also, does it make sense from what we're speaking about at J3U and fit into that that context? So I asked for one, uh, Nick Walker said, and I messaged him and said, hey, Nick, how much protein are you eating or what's your food quantity amount? And he said eight ounces of, of basically just meat per, per meal, six times per day, which this is cooked weight meal, right? So... Um, a lot of people, some people do raw, usually from raw to cooked, you're losing about 25% of weight. So however you want to be calculating this out, but we, we can roughly say that's like 65 grams of protein per meal. And that's not counting trace protein. Okay. So say he was in the off season phase eating 350 grams of rice. That's about 10 grams of protein just from rice alone. So what I've seen with putting in nutrition facts and trace protein amounts, you could easily add another 100 grams of protein on yeah. top of that, um, on top of that figure, which, so for Nick, he's probably sits somewhere up, up in that low 400, mid 400 mark of protein per day. Now give it also that Nick is a 300 pound bodybuilder in the off season, roughly, you know, fluctuations around that. He, he did say like, you know, in, into prep, this doesn't really change. So the rice content, it's obviously, obviously going down, but also body weight's going down too. So, so likely that kind of might scale along the same lines, mm -hmm. which you're looking at about 1.5 grams per pound of body weight. I also talked to Brett Wilkin and go figure you're like, they're both coached with Matt. So relatively these guys are of the same size. So likely similar protein amounts. And it, it was the fact like, um, uh, Brett does about eight ounces of just meat per meal, which same figures that align with, with Nick. Again, these are all Olympia level guys, big individuals. So looking at 1.5 gram per pound. Also reached out to uh, Andre Presti, who's 
I believe this is going to be his, I believe it's his Olympia debut. He won um, Portugal. Yep. I, real, I'm a fan of his physique because he's just like granite hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is cool to see. So he said, hey, off season, I usually eat 320 grams of protein. And my weight is uh, 297 pounds. So from direct protein, he's like a little over one gram per pound of body weight. But but he did say that is only counting uh, protein in direct sources, right? So again, tack on potentially another 100, 120 grams from trace protein. That probably puts him into that low 400 gram mark, which which for him, yeah, he's somewhere maybe 1.4 gram per pound of body weight. Yep. Um, he, he was saying, you know, I mentioned to him, like, man, many, many people are think like all these large pros are eating like 300 grams of, of protein per meal. He's like, yeah, they think it the same here in Italy. And so he's like, yeah, two meals are like 350 grams of fish. Two meals are 250 grams of chicken. And uh, then he has one to two meals are 450 grams of egg white. So, you know, add that all up. That's what he's kind of sitting around. So we see pretty similar protein amount for him. Mm -hmm. Um, I also just... I, I just stalked Samson's YouTube and, <laughs> and went through Samson Dowda because this is a tremendously large human, right? Yeah. Uh, was he 320, 330 pounds in the off season? I looked at his day of eating like in prep. And then also it was like two years ago in the off season. And it's actually nearly identical food sources that he was using then. And even now. Mm -hmm. So the protein amounts didn't change between prep and off season. And, uh, like, for instance, meal one was five eggs and a scoop away. So, you know, looking 55 grams ish of protein. Meal two, 200 grams of steak. Meal three was 180 <coughs> grams of bin, uh, beef mint, mint, uh, mints. Meal four and five, 250 grams of chicken. Meal six, 180 grams of salmon. Then he did have, like, some intra workout aminos that he was doing around that. Uh, surprisingly, that's not a very high <coughs> protein intake. You know, they were looking between seven to eight ounces of, of cooked meat per meal with some shakes and things in there. Yeah. And really what was scaling up when he when his off season was just, you know, the quantity of carbohydrate and fat from yeah. there. So with, with Samson, again, we're seeing someone that's falling within this kind of 1.3, maybe to 1.5 gram per pound of body weight. So that was the uh, four, four individuals that are all pretty damn close to 300 pounds. All we would say like, uh, you know, some of them, are not substantially growing anymore, but absolutely improving, adding tissue on. And a few of these guys, like Andre Sampson, they've made large size increases. Yep. Hell, Sampson's like growing in prep, and he's on like a relatively lower protein take for what we would consider, for, or what what is thought to be, have been out there, right? Yep. And so may, maybe it's also to like, what what is the thought of what what is even out there? I feel like we're at an age where, Protein take is scaled down Quite since the old, older older era uh, of bodybuilding. Yeah, I think I think there's an understanding too of like protein's role in recovery capacity and how I think a lot of this actually stems from bodybuilding becoming a little bit more performance based. Is kind of how I look at this because we're gonna have food volume limits on what people can actually get down, and people are trying to scale carbohydrates in order to support the training performance. And then you've also seen like the popularization of insulin use and things along those lines that have kind of started to drive nutrient uptake via carbohydrate use as well. Shout out to Milos. Um, but that's kind of like where I think we're starting to see like total protein intakes coming down because we're seeing an understanding of what drives training performance and what drives recovery capacity and how many different variables can actually lead to tissue accrual. And essentially just making sure that protein is sufficient for recovery capacity, but not so high that we're causing GI distress and issues just with like bloating and, and, and satiety being so high that it's having people have issues with getting the food down. And so, because that's one of the benefits of protein intake, right? That's a strategy that we've talked about using in prep is as someone moves across prep, we can actually increase that protein intake to one account for the residuals coming down, but two to help people with satiety. And we're just starting to learn that as bodybuilding becomes a little bit more performance based over the last eight to 10 years, nutritional strategies are starting to change to support that. Yeah. I think like probably the intakes I saw, at least in older bodybuilders, not older, but 
older generation, man, was like 10 to 12 ounces of, of say meat 12. per meal, yeah. which is crazy high. I couldn't even imagine eating that much. I, I, I met, I met Flex Wheeler. Um, this was, gosh, I was working at GNC. I was in my early twenties powerlifting. Then this is probably like God, maybe fifteen years ago. Yeah, and he he told me like on prep, man, he'd have to go to McDonald's to eat a meal just so he could like have a BM and and, and take a take a crap. <laughs> Be- I, and likely, you know, I I didn't I didn't dive into you know I didn't know what I knew back then, but but it's very likely because these guys were following just like crazy high protein intake diets and we have that study with jose antonio looking at really high protein intakes like they were using like about two grams per pound of body weight and and that was one of the biggest complaints of the subjects was a lot of guys just couldn't get the food down because of so much gi distress which protein you know it, it can cause a lot of constipation so you can have a lot of GI issues, but I think you're right. That's a, that's an insightful thing that, you know, through the nineties into two thousands, we saw this shift, I think towards carbohydrate, uh, maybe that spurred on in, with, with growth hormone and, and insulin usage. But I do think we had a greater understanding of training performance as well. And that has led to what we see now. Arguably we have the largest bodybuilders ever. And I know they, you know, you would claim that, the late nineties was like the mass monster era. And yes, people were like large, but I think we have more larger individuals now and quality than, than was back then. Like if those guys actually, and and they still condition was better back then. I I argue that's not, I think just, it was just poor quality camera footage. (laughs) Uh, um, So I I think right now seeing even lower, lowered protein takes with higher carbohydrate intakes, we're seeing bodybuilders that, are substantially improved. And I, I would say like people might bring up drugs. I don't think the drugs have changed drastically since that late 90 era into current, like nothing's came about. That's now game changing. Um, Cause we had like our era of like growth hormone and insulin and, and, all, and that kind of sized everyone up. So I don't think the the drug factor has played into that. Um, Not at all. But anyway, yeah. Anyway, so with, with protein, there is going to be a point of no return for fat-free mass, right? Yep. And so it's like, well, what is that? And let's, not, let's make sure, hell, we don't leave shit on the table because we want to optimize protein. And, and basically, with our bodies, you know, you're going to intake protein. We don't store protein necessarily. Uh, I mean, there is an amino acid pool that's kind of floating around in serum, They might, you might consider your amino acid pool being part of tissues as well, but all these tissues are a constant state of breakdown and also rebuilding. So it's this flux that's happening. So when we take in amino acids, they could be sent to body proteins to be part of that exchange, but anything beyond that, it's either going to be going towards maybe creating other nitrogenous compounds like nucleotides or creatine or hormones Outside of those things, body tissue and some other amino acid type hormone production, beyond that, you're oxidizing it and it's getting turned to urea and excreted. So most of it's going to be waste product. A small amount could be you know, utilized to produce glucose, maybe even stored as fat, but we see it's highly inefficient to store as body fat. And it's also highly ineffective to produce glucose from. So if you've already maxed out what you're able to do muscle building wise, you're now making a very, very inefficient fuel source for glucose or just a lot of waste product to pee out. So the point is like, well, where do you scale that to where we're getting everything we need for body tissue and we don't have extra waste that is occurring. And that's where we kind of see what where the research world aligns with, because that's what we want to test and research. Where is Where are these limits, and where should we really set the maximums or the minimums to make sure that we're getting everything out of it from a bodybuilding perspective? And I can get into the recommendations of what's been out there. Like, that yeah. makes yeah, go a, ahead. A, a sense of flow. Yeah, and, back it and out. Like, <laughs> so, that like, our... Sense. Mm. Our, our our current standing like within the research world and if you look at like say the international society of sport nutrition like their ranges are 1.4 to 2 gram per kilogram of body weight 
or if you're in a caloric deficit, 2.3 to 3.1. So that's getting up towards, maybe, what is that, maybe 1.3 gram per pound of body weight yeah. uh, in, in, in a hypocaloric state because you have a potentially, higher you're going to get less higher need, greater protein breakdown, and also there's less synthesis generated from, um, from weight training stimulus. Yep. Now, where some of that data comes from, if we look across like multiple studies, right, we have a review paper by Morden looked across 49 studies at what's going to max out fat-free mass. And it ended up being an average of 1.6 gram per kilogram of body weight. You see that number cited all over the place in the evidence-based world. And I, I want people to realize is that that is an average and there is a confidence interval within that average. And so there's some people that did better on even higher, some people even a little bit lower. And the top end of this interval within that 1.6 was 2.2 gram per kilogram of body weight. So 1.6 would be like the minimum, the, the minimum to get a, an effect out of, uh, to potentially for some people, but some people need 2.2. So I would, wouldn't want to be a minimalist approach. At the very minimum, I would say take 2.2 because the risk of consuming a little bit more is, is not that vast at all. No. Now that's what you're seeing as far as what would be potentially maxing out fat-free mass. But like you mentioned earlier, we know protein does a lot of other things. We're not just coaching someone just around what's building mass. We're looking at total body composition. We're looking at sustainability and adherence on a diet as well. Yep. And those studies we mentioned earlier with Jose Antonio, he, he was looking at this. He looked at uh, body composition changes on really high protein intake diets. Yep. And he compared over eight weeks, 1.8 gram per kilogram versus 4.4 gram per kilogram. I think it's the highest protein intake I've seen in, in a study. Um, interesting thing is that group consuming the high protein, they actually consumed an extra 800 calories per day. And there's no difference in fat-free mass, right? So... They happen to max out fat-free mass gain, but also no change in fat mass either, despite the high-protein group eating an extra 800 calories per day. He did a follow-up study with 2.3 gram per kilogram and 3.4 gram per kilogram body weight, and the high-protein group actually lost fat fat free mass, oh, sorry, fat mass. Yep. And they had the same fat mass gain. So now you have people on a high protein intake diet, actually losing body fat <laughs> and gaining and gaining fat free mass. Um, potentially explanations around that. They, they weren't really investigating it. They said maybe it was an inaccuracy of tr calorie tracking to where the group with high protein in intake, it just suppressed hunger. And so yeah. they end up eating less. Uh, maybe it was the thermic effect of food. Protein takes a lot of calories to digest. So that could be part of it too. Um, maybe it was tracking of meat, right? Maybe they were just end up being more active, eating a lot of protein. So you can't really say, um, it's kind of speculative, but what we know anecdotally, like absolutely like protein would be appetite suppressive, also very challenging to store as body fat. So I think there's application here for off season phase, or you have someone that maybe there's the easy person that gains body fat, or they also are having high hunger still in the off season or in prep for that matter, like increasing protein take beyond what maximizes fat free mass could have some rationale ar around that. Um, I think another takeaway here is that with appetite suppression, getting too high in protein in the off season, when you're trying to really put mass on and have a lot of calories, if you can't get your food down, this might be rationale of lowering your protein intake to be able to not spend expensive glucose from protein and just intake more carbohydrate and fats. Um, so yeah, some good, good takeaways there. So that's kind of where, where it all sits in the research world and you'll see those kind of ranges um, around. Now what we see anecdotally is a little bit on the higher end, but I think we're also accounting for, for one, not leaving anything on the table. Yep. Then, then also the other components that we spoke of around, hey, potentially this might lean to uh, leaner massing for some individuals or hunger control. And, and so I guess we get to a point like, does that, does that align? Or is it still excessive of what we see anecdotally? No, because I think just you just 
pull the data points of like the 3.4 essentially being the star group out of the the two studies that were cited it's like well that's right at like 1.5 grams per pound right and that yeah. bottom that bottom end range being 2.2 based off that confidence interval it's like you're right in that 1 to 1.5 where you're probably seeing most people around contest prep around 1.5 grams per pound and then if hunger signaling is getting blunted in the off season even dropping to 1.25 is still going to see fat free mass maximized and and we're going to be able to open up some room for hunger signaling and potentially get more caloric intake in and and find that peak off season be a little bit higher than where they could potentially be if they were getting the GI disruption from these super high protein intakes. So for me it's it's still falling within matching anecdotally what we're seeing in the research world. I think if you would have done this 15 years ago there would have been a lot more misalignment because we would have seen these people doing, I remember reading the flex magazines and these people eating like 12 ounces of protein. I'm like 12 ounces of protein. That's like uh, one, how do you get that down? But two, like, how do you afford this? Because I'm like a broke ass college student at this point. And you know, it's just like, you're trying to do what's best by reading every single flex and muscular development. And you're like, okay, I'm not a 300 pound behemoth. So maybe I don't need to do that. But at the same token, you you start to see the misalignment there, but the development of the anecdote with research really kind of starting to align. And I think one of the things to consider, and I do want to bring this up, is like protein efficiency with PEDs, because I do think we need to start to get into what variables could impact protein intake and understanding that all of these data points don't take into consideration PEDs and our efficiency to utilize protein with PEDs in play. Yeah, so I guess that's that's the consideration point of like, well, well, these guys might have a higher requirement of protein utilizing yep. PDs, and a, a few things that are going to dictate uh, increasing dosage of, of protein. Pot- potentially, it could be the volume of mm-hmm. training. Yep. If you're giving someone a, a higher stimulus to grow, and they're going to grow at a faster rate, that absolutely could drive a need for higher protein. But keep that in context, right? Like if you're a beginner or you're new to PDs, the, the growth rate is going to be very, very fast, requiring high protein. Now, as you get more advanced, the amount of muscle you gain is so slow. <laughs> so think of, I mean, think about if you gained even three pounds of muscle across an entire year of stage weight, pure contractile tissue, right? Um, you know, that's, what what is that, Luke? A hundred and call it a... Uh, 1200 grams or something, 1300 grams of actual tissue. Yeah. Divide that out by 12 months. That's massive. It's a, it, 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 yeah. But also think about protein intake, right? Oh, yeah. If you, it's like putting a hundred grams of protein on per month in a per, <laughs> in a per day aspect, hundred grams divided by 30 days. You, you, you know, you're, you're looking at like, Point uh, three. yeah, 0.3 grams is of actual protein. Is that right? No. That's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So. Did we math um, that? I don't think three, we math. No, it'd three, be three grams. It, three, three grams. Three, three, three point three three. Yeah. Sorry, guys. We're, <laughs> we're doing this in our head. That would be actually three grams of amino acids getting incorporated into tissue um, per, day. per day. So how much more protein do you need beyond <laughs> that? Well, now that's just a kind of a, a stupid math equation, right? Like we're not going to actually only add in three grams because there also is a lot of other costs that come along with building tissue yeah but but just for some context there like as you grow at a slower rate you absolutely can make a good argument that protein need is going to go down because you simply just aren't using as much a few other considerations age yeah so as you become older there is a bit of more anabolic resistance that occurs to where you need a higher dose of protein for that same type of response as when you're younger now i think we we're going to get to our kind of recommendation, but we're still going to fall within that range. Uh, body composition will matter. The leaner you are, the more susceptible to lean lean mass loss and prep. So you would have higher protein needs. Also, like someone that's 300 pounds, that's 30% body fat is going to have a lot different protein need than someone that is, you know, 10% body fat, 300 pounds. And then also, you know, like we mentioned, the, the training status component. But all, all those factors will factor in along with PEDs. Uh-huh. So I guess your your question now is, well, do PEDs really make you require a higher amount of protein? And 
so the the study that I would bring up, and again, guys, we're not going to have the perfect study here where yeah. we have guys that are that are trained that start on two groups with testosterone, we give one high protein, one low protein, and we see what was the difference. That doesn't exist. Um, I've looked, <laughs> and it's it's uh, no longer ever going to be a study because there's no no rationale for it in the risk. But yeah. anyway, Bazin in 2001 did a study. 61 men. This was a graded testosterone study. So put different groups on different amounts of testosterone. Getting to the point here quickly is that the testosterone group on 600 milligrams per week for 20 weeks gained 18 pounds of uh, fat-free mass. So this is a combo of water and actual contractile tissue. They were on 1.2 gram per kilogram body weight of protein. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want you to think like, well, maybe they, I know someone would say, they maybe they would gain more if they took more protein. Uh, potentially, I, I suppose. Um, but I would say, like, well, look at the anecdotal. We have plenty of guys eating three times that amount of protein. And how many people are putting on 18 pounds of, of muscle mass <laughs> in 20 weeks? Like, we rarely see that anymore. Like, yeah. so what is more of the rationale around this? And what I would bring up is there's a, a study for two studies, Church 2019 and uh, Fernando 92, and they looked at giving doses of testosterone, fasted, and what would happen to this amino acid pool. And what they see is like for one, steroid use does increase the protein synthetic efficiency. So basically testosterone does increase protein synthesis. It makes you have more anabolic building processes to drive those amino acids into that building process, if you're not intaking aminos, it'll actually take what you're breaking down in tissue and reincorporate them back into tissue, which is super cool to think about. Um, so in turn, you become much more efficient with the protein that you're already intaking. So even if you say we're on very suboptimal intake, like these guys taking 600 migs of tests per week, it doesn't matter because they are so much more efficient with that amount of protein. Mm -hmm. So, so we have to extrapolate a bit from these different studies to say, Hey, using PDs, it's pretty good rationale. Like if you're intaking within this range that we know would max out fat free mass and leave in a little extra to make sure we don't leave anything on the table that would fully optimize what you're able to do, whether you're enhanced or natural. And I think you can make a really good case that actually, if you're enhanced, you could probably use even less protein than a natural. Now, I wouldn't suggest necessarily doing that because, again, we're bodybuilders and we don't want to be minimalist. But you, you definitely, the argument's there stronger than the argument that you need more if you are enhanced. Absolutely. And I think a lot of that starts to come down to understanding the variables that we discussed that can affect it from a volume and an athlete experience perspective that now start to drive that decision making more than whether the PEDs are there. And I think this further starts to to make the point of anecdotally, we saw what three of those four athletes not changing protein requirements or protein portion sizes as they get into prep, yeah. which theoretically PEDs are going to be escalating across prep for those athletes specifically due to the contest schedule that they typically run, where we're seeing tissue retention, you know, happen extremely efficiently. Like, I don't know how you could look at Samson and say that he lost any tissue when he steps on stage and same with Nick and same with Brett. Like, so how, how would you then extrapolate any thought process out when we have those data points from the three studies kind of cited? And then also the anecdotal evidence that protein portions are not even changing. And then that's going to guide kind of the actual practice decision-making of, yeah, enhanced athletes are probably not going to need it. And as long as we're doing the things that retain tissue well, training performance, PEDs are in play, managing stress and recovery capacity, we're probably going to be right where we need to be as far as retaining tissue. And as we know, and as John knows very well right now, you know, GI issues across a contest prep are very common. And the more we can remove variables that are going to conflate that, like extremely high protein intakes, then the better we can typically be as far as like producing the best athlete on stage. Yeah. I mean, you could make a very good argument around towards like how, how I would want to periodize protein. And, and maybe that is the, the word the next conversation <laughs> have a, uh, across the calendar year for what you're bringing up is 
you know, moving into an off season phase where food volumes are increasing, you're having more trace protein come in, you could potentially scale back on your direct protein sources. And just, just the minor point around that about trace protein is that it, it can be a substantial amount, especially for individuals that are on very high mm-hmm. carbohydrate amounts. Like, like I mentioned earlier, like 350 grams of rice is like 10 grams of protein mm-hmm. across six meals a day. If you only eat rice, that's 60 grams of protein. Um, and so, you know, with these guys, it's standardized. They eat the same meal every day. Those protein takes aren't being adjusted. So they scale up and down, which in that case, it's not as big of a deal because it, those proteins kind of are accounted for. Now, if you have someone though, that's doing more macro matching or food adjustments are being made across the day, you might have a, a carb source that's really low in protein or you might not. Um, and so you might see vast changes in protein intakes. Uh, personally, I count them all because I see even your rice protein or your protein from peanut butter or whatever it may be is just as effective within a total intake amount for muscle building. And just to like, you know, there's studies on this that are your rice first um, way studies. I know my rice first way studies. They, they did a study with, uh, Resistance trained individuals for eight weeks. Yep. One group had 50 grams of whey supplemented um, after training. The other groups had 50 grams. It was actually 48 grams of rice protein. You think, well, no one's going to grow off rice protein. And it ended up, they had the same impact on body composition change. No difference after eight weeks. And it, I would mention, though, that the they had 25% of their calorie intake coming from protein. So the thing here is that once you're meeting a, a sufficient total protein intake, even if some portion is coming from what we would consider a, a lower quality protein source that's not complete in the amino acids, your, your total pool for the day is sufficient to make up for it. I would say if you're on the very low intake side of protein, like a 1.6 gram per kilogram of body weight, that's where that really might be more of a concern mm-hmm. where the the, the amount of, you know, low quality protein sources is, is outweighing the amount of high quality or you're like a vegan athlete that only consumes plant-based proteins. But once you meet this threshold where, Hey, if at least 50% of your protein is coming from direct high quality sources, even if the other 50% is coming from trace proteins, uh, that is kind of washed out that effect of, um, the amino acid quality. And also even the distribution doesn't seem to matter as much either. Mm -hmm. So you, you eat a meal, say a steak meal, a a piece of steak could be giving you a stream of amino acids in a mixed meal setting for seven plus hours. So we're eating every two and a half, three hours. So you're absolutely having this overlap of amino acids from your other meals. So like it used to be a big deal, like, Oh, you needed three grams of leucine for per feeding, and people are adding more leucine in. It tasted horrible. Add leucine powder. But that's just kind of washed out um, once you meet this threshold for total protein intake for the day. So, so personally, I would count trace protein because it absolutely does contribute to hypertrophy outcomes. It also is contributed to calorie outcomes. So you might have someone on a, on a 500 calorie difference just from their trace Sentos. protein intakes. And if you have these guys in the off season where you're running into like, man, I just can't get all this food down. Like I have no appetite. And you look at their protein take like, well, man, you're only at 330 grams of protein. When in reality, they're actually at 450 grams of protein. We could use that data and be like, all right, let's scale back some of their, their, their protein sources and push up carbohydrate. And that would be more beneficial to drive in that growth process yep. and not having appetite. So, so suppressed. Um, so back to the point though, Luke, of what, <laughs> yeah, I, was I, was ta- say. what I was talking about, about periodization of protein throughout the calendar year for a bodybuilder is that as you move into the off season phase, you know, be counting all these protein sources, you might set somewhat up on the, a bit on the lower end. So maybe 1.3 gram, 1.2 gram. Then as those carbohydrates are getting added in, it's kind of already accounted for if you're using that type of style of diet, 
or you just account for them at the whole time. You set them at like this 1.3 to 1.5 gram per pound, and then you're just adjusting along the way. So two different ways to do it. Both can work well. Just depends how you want to program things as an athlete and a coach. Then once we get into like a contest prep scenario, those protein amounts might need to scale back up as the carbohydrate amount is coming down. Um, other strategies around the calendar year might be post-show. You might push someone really high protein if they struggle with hunger and adherence in, in that phase. Uh, that could, could be one strategy. You might even have someone that is in a holding phase, a cruise phase, whatever you want to call it, between push-ups and contest prep, where the same thing you might see, right? Your, your gear's lower. You might be a little bit easier to transition towards body fat. Mm -hmm. So we bring down some carbohydrate and we could shift that into protein, protein. and we could keep, we could keep calorie intake higher yep. in that sense. So that's how you might scale the protein up and down throughout the calendar year. I don't think you need to really overthink it because in the trenches, what we actually see is guys just, they're just kind of float around this, this range. That's for sure. Like covering all bases. So, you know, that's a, uh, at least, at least periodization of protein. And then also, do your are your vegan sources you know adequate and they are <laughs> yeah and it's it's more going to be about like total protein intake across the day right because i mean we're seeing protein synthesis typically maximize between 20 and 40 grams per meal but like once we start getting into these total higher protein intakes like the net caloric intake from protein having enough amino acid pools where we're crossing amino acids and getting complete amino acids they're typically not going to have an issue where i could see the problem arising is during a contest prep or a long diet phase for a vegan where a lot of these foods that have these residuals get pulled but they're used for the amino acids that they provide start to provide an issue with getting complete uh, or total protein intake as high as it needs to be and this is where like a rice-based protein powder, a pea-based protein powder serves really well with this athlete. Kind of sucks because then you're like relying on protein powders and that food volume is like really low, but <laughs> hunger is shooting through the roof and the thing that you want is more protein. But it's it's kind of how you're going to have to troubleshoot that specifically for a vegan athlete that's trying to, to, to prep for sure. Yeah, the, the pea protein is actually relatively pretty complete. Yeah. Y using a mix of the two. Um, you can actually get something that's very close to whey protein. Yeah. But you're right. You'd probably be really, really hungry across <laughs> the prep. entire day. <laughs> you mentioned something that I, if someone was listening that, you know, with in a per meal basis, we see 20 to 40 grams can max out protein synthesis. Yeah. That's 0.4 gram per kilogram per meal. And so where you see some of the recommendations around 1.6 gram per kilogram is the assumption of using four meals per day, 0.4 grams per meal, and totaling that up four times four, 1.6 grams per meal. So that's, uh, again, on the lower in, in, slower side of that equation. We've also seen that, yes, that's amount for protein synthesis, but also there was a, a comparison study with up to 70 grams of protein in one sitting, yep. and that was what was needed to prevent protein breakdown, breakdown. for several hours following. So... It, on a, on a per meal basis, it's never the question. Cause this man, this was off those studies, Luke, that came out. That's when it was like, this is the maximum amount you can digest and absorb at one time. And that's not the issue at all with protein. <laughs> yeah. Um, absorption, digestion, like that's rarely ever the, even the issue you could intake probably a hundred grams. It'd just be perfectly fine. However, at, at, at a frequency point that gets too low, um, that's where you're going to run into not having enough like pulses of surges of protein to where you're getting that protein synthesis response frequent, as frequent as you're able to get throughout the day. So it, yes, it's about total protein take, but at the same token, you can't go falling in some extreme side of like really low frequency or even that of really, really high frequency to where your protein boluses are so small and overlapping because you probably do want, you want to want a large enough bolus of, of protein uh, to really stimulate that process. So like on a per meal basis, I stay in that 0.4 to 0.65 grams per kilogram, which easily falls into what we see in the anecdotal, you know, like uh, with, with the like Nick or Brett or one of these guys, they're yep. 75 grams of protein per meal and you're 
whatever. What is that? 130 kilogram, something like that. 135 kilogram. Yeah. Uh, bodybuilder. I mean, could easily much. fall off on that. Um, it's like so, 136 yeah. kilos for a 300 pound bodybuilder. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, last point to bring up here is, you know, safety, I think around high protein it takes. Cause you're like, okay, <laughs> yeah, you absolutely consume like higher protein and, and, and where we fall, like for our recommendation is we fall at the very, very lowest end of one gram per pound of body weight. But then we put that maximum at 1.5 gram per pound of body weight. Cause mm-hmm. I, I feel like beyond that, you're getting to a point of inefficiency of fuel source and where we could allocate just more food towards carbohydrate, which is absolutely can drive a lot of anabolic process or even dietary fats, which we, we do need another conversation for a different um, day. However, the same, same studies that uh, Jose Antonio looking at the high protein takes, he extended these studies out looking at protein safety. And so he looked at over two years, protein and organ health. This was in five bodybuilders. So again, it's not a huge study. We don't know, what level these bodybuilders were at, but the protein take average was 3.5 gram per kilogram, which is right at 1.5 gram per pound. There was no abnormal liver or kidney function across that whole two years. Now this is considerate of these individuals are natural and a healthy population. And so there's a lot of thought, at least when I, where I come from in my area being a dietitian and in the clinical setting is that with kidney kidney patients, about to say kidney. Um, high protein intakes uh, are, are really problematic for these kidney patients as they're not able to filter all the protein as efficiently. And you can see higher protein losses that are occurring, but also they build up um, urea and nitrogen from protein breakdown, mm-hmm. which can cause like to- toxicity to occur. Um and so that's when you see like high creatinine levels, high BUN levels in, in the serum uh, from nitrogenous protein waste not being able to get past the kidney and and urinate it out. Mm-hmm. So that's where that came from. Like, oh, high protein intake for kidney patients, that's that's bad. We want them on lower protein intakes to be easier on the kidney and not cause this buildup of, of toxic components. And that's And that's true. But that's not the same for a healthy individual. Mm-hmm. But the question is, are enhanced bodybuilders healthy individuals? And that's something that you would have to really extrapolate studies around because you can look at, there, there's a, a few few studies that look at groups of bodybuilders that have been admitted around kidney issues. And some of these guys were running like, I remember there was one study, they were all averaging around 1,000 milligrams of total anabolics per week. And they all had some degree of kidney damage that had occur and lower GFR scores in association. So if you have a bodybuilder that actually is undergoing like kidney stress, a high protein intake on top of that, you could see more, more strain on the kidneys because Mm -hmm. we would quote these individuals as not being as healthy. They're not healthy, natural individuals. You're pushing the limits. Um, And we know PDs just in general drive more inflammation and oxidation on kidney function. So I would absolutely would be more on the conservative side for protein, just being in an enhanced bodybuilder, watch your lab work is going to be the main thing here. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're pulling labs for cystatin C. It's a marker you can use to estimate your kidney function off of. That's more accurate because it doesn't account for your lean body mass like creatinine does. So that way we'll give you a good estimate. I'd also add on a urinalysis to your lab work so you can see if protein is showing up in the urine, which it should not be. Just doing those two things would give you some good good insight. Also, I think in your lab work, if you're seeing your BUN score is really high, your blood urea nitrogen, and you know you're going in hydrated, likely protein intake might just be a little bit over the top. You could probably scale it back because of that, because what that means is a lot of that is just nitrogenous waste that you're just excreting out. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean you have ki- you poor kidney function. It just means you're on a high protein intake diet. Could be perfectly fine, but you might get to the point of like just this excessive protein intake um, to where you could scale back and maybe that would be a little less strain on the kidneys for a bodybuilder who's also enhanced pushing the limits of their their kidneys. Now, again, that's 
trying to piece together lots of different research lines and, and what you're seeing, what's occurring with the bodybuilders. Uh, but, but in general, still our recommendations here, like for JTU is bottom end one gram per pound of body weight, top end 1.5 gram per pound of body weight, shifting that around based on the athlete's needs and season, and then monitoring your lab work accordingly to make sure we are keeping all, all health metrics um, in line in, in risk reduction uh, when it needs to be in place where we are going to push the limits and see a little bit of health marker derangement because that's the reality of high-level bodybuilding, that we're going to accept some risk and accept some lab derangement in order to uh, push towards our goals. Yeah, and I think it's like remembering not to put the cart before the horse as well as far as like blaming one versus the other and understanding PD's influence on renal function and how that influences renal function and some of the strategies that we use to manage that on the PED side so that the, the protein portion of the issue is not there. What I like to do as well is I'll even have people create a spreadsheet of kidney function that kind of goes from left to right so you can see if the trends are going in a certain direction and then kind of overimpose that up across the PED use that they've been using so that I can see if we're seeing a trend in one direction or the other. Um, I like Excel spreadsheets, so that's my Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that's very <laughs> nerdy. <laughs> very nerdy of you so like I'll, I'll just like to see the trends of like are we seeing detriment to kidney function um, and this is where you'll actually see across this data trend um, the need for cystatin C to get accuracy in that kidney function will be increasingly needed as an athlete goes through a larger portion of their career um, so you can actually understand whether what you're doing is managing the renal detriment from the PED side of the equation or if there's also new not or, and if there's nutritional requirement changes that need to happen for that athlete across those trends. And so that's where like having that data piled up can, can really help. Well, I think that wraps up our protein lecture. So our lecture to turn into a lecture, right? Just, our, uh, uh, you more protein equals more mass. Does it? And, well, there's, there's a, there's a limit. That's, yeah. that's the thing about it. So well, anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. We will talk to you next time. And see you then.